Miami is looking for a turnaround, of course, after a five and seven season. And if there's a guy in college football that is pretty well familiar with turnarounds, it would be their new defensive coordinator. Welcome to Miami Hurricanes Live right here at the Voice of College Football. Of course, this is our Cam special Wednesday night each and every week. Cam delivers. Bring some folks in here. You've got plenty of time. Get out there on social media. I think Twitter is up and running again. So get out there on social media. Bring some folks in and uh, let's talk it up. Cam, great to see you. How are you doing tonight? Good, good. Can't complain. Uh, well, I mean, TweetDeck is not working. So, uh, and that's my app of choice. So, which is owned by Twitter. Like it's a Twitter extension, like, you know, so, or it's a Twitter owned thing. So uh, I need them to get that fixed. Um, but other than that, yeah, no, uh, we're good. Um, you know, finally got to, or made one move on the coaching front. And uh, yeah, you know, a couple more to go, but a a small step is still a step. And I think that this was even a big step. I am going to admit a lot of ignorance on one Lance Gidry, um, other than, as I stated off the top, uh, Tulane was a two and 10 football team two years ago, and they defeated USC in the cotton bowl to finish a 12 and two season in which they placed in the top 10 in the nation. But wasn't he at Marshall this past year? Oh, he was at Marshall this past. Yes. Oh, I am blanking boy. That screws up everything I just said right off the top. Absolutely. (laughs) Yes, you are right. He was supposed to be the Tulane defensive coordinator this season. Yes, and right. Miami has was... intercepted him. He was at Marshall last year. Marshall's been a good group of five football team as well, but not as dramatic of a uh, story there in, in regards to Tulane uh, and what they achieved last year. Yeah, well, I mean, not as dramatic as a story overall, but in terms of the defense, like, the numbers were elite, man. You know, like, you're talking um, number one or number three in stop rate nationally, number one in uh, – was a pass defense, like, you know, they're creating havoc all over the place. Like, I was looking for this tweet, I didn't, you know, um, with all the stats in there. Um, let me find it. Lance. Yeah, that one. Okay. And if I go to his media tab. Oh, yeah. So, they were number one in third down defense, number two in stop rate nationally, number three in pass defense. A pass efficiency defense, defensive efficiency overall, yards per play allowed, fifth in turnovers gained in rushing defense, sixth in scoring defense interceptions, eighth in total defense, first in uh, first down defense, and then 12th in defensive touchdowns, 16th in sacks, 19th in red zone defense, and 20th in tackles for loss. Like, wow, bro. Like, yeah, I mean, they, they went into Notre Dame. He called an incredible game to beat them um, in like, basically that defense wrecked shop. So, you know, this is a guy who, you know, is coached in a bunch of places. He was head coach at McNeese state in Louisiana. Um, I know that school because Joe Dumars for your Detroit Pistons hall of famer went there. And I just remember, you know, when they always did the starting lineups when I was a kid in the eighties and everything, you know, number four for McNeese state, Joe Dumars. And I'm like, I knew of McNeese state before. Like, I mean, because of that more than, you know, before I even knew about Miami or anything. Uh, but, yeah, he was a head coach there. He's been a defensive coordinator in a couple places and in the same kind of interaction as with Kevin Steele, who had days before taken the job at Maryland, went into a meeting and was like, so I'm actually going to go to Miami and help them build their program, you know, because he loves that program uh, <laughs> word. And, and when it was like, yo, so, like, I know that I just got hired here, but I'm going there, <laughs> Right. And Lance Gadry did the same thing. This goes back to what I was talking about last week. If you're only looking at guys who are unemployed at this time as for who Miami is going to target and hire for their staff, that is foolish. That Like, this has been proven time and time again. So that's the last two defensive coordinators. That's the last – or two of the last three offensive coordinators. And actually, no, three of three because Red Lashley had a job when we hired him. So, I mean, the last five coordinators that Miami's hired – have been people up off of their good job somewhere else. Mario Cristobal had a good job somewhere else, and we got him about that. This is, again, going to what I'm talking about, man. Even if – now, Lance Gidry was not a name that was bandied about. It was not a name that was reported or rumored or anything. Again, I fully believe, with the exception of Bruce Feldman, who's a Miami alum, 
incredible national reporter for the athletic. He's been everywhere, you know, ESPN, Yahoo, doing college football, uh, you know, coverage for, you know, 20 years. If it's not coming from him and you hear it, then that's not who it's going to be. And I'm not demeaning or diminishing, you know, any of the other journalists who say anything or they report things or they've heard things or all those other things. That's Mario testing leaks, bro. But like, name me the last assistant that was hired that you knew about. You didn't. None. Zero since Mario's been here. None. Not a single one. But the quality is there. And Lance Guidry, you know, was going to be hired by Mario Cristobal years ago at FIU. But Pete Garcia, FIU's moron of an athletic director who decided to fire Mario Cristobal in a, you know, power struggle. I was trying to find an appropriate term for that, uh, you know, but a, a measuring contest, you know what I'm talking about. Um, because Cristobal runs his program the way that he runs and Pete Garcia wanted to be, you know, the alpha dog and basically run that program. Also, he's like, no, like you hired me to run this program. So I'm going to run the program. But anyway, Pete Garcia, because he didn't like Mario Cristobal fired him, but that season or that off season was when it's reported that Mario was going to hire Lance Guidry to be the defensive coordinator, but he's, you know, been around uh, other places. He hired other guys, da, 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 but then the opportunity presented itself. And he's like, yo, this is that moment. Let's get it. Um, and so, yeah, he's going to coordinate this defense. It's going to be multiple. Uh, it's going to be a similar kind of attack. And hopefully it's more structurally sound, especially in the back end than what we saw this past year. But I mean, you should be excited. And I think that we're going to be able to start to use all, all of the defensive players to uh, more towards their potential and the top end of their abilities uh, with a coordinator such as Lance Guidry. I'm very excited. I think it's a, I think it's a home run hire, um, you know, and I don't really like the names are great, but like the resume that he brings in the like most recent performance that he's had in role. I mean, it's second to none. Now, we need to see that same kind of performance here in Miami, which, you know, has been the issue where we've hired, you know, Kevin Steele, a 40 year veteran who's, I mean, he's going back to Alabama for his third time coordinating their defense or working with Saban, you know. Uh, Josh Gaddis was famously the Bros Award winner and like that shit went south i mean whoo boy but in with lance gidry there's a lot to like full stop i also need to see that kind of performance here in miami and it's been a while since i mean even with obviously still with some roster constraints obviously still with just the way you know a lacking offensive line and things like that Rhett lashley did not like in the offense did numbers, but when it came crunch time and we needed to run the ball, when we're down a touchdown and those defensive ends on the other team got to pin their ears back and just get up the field, things got a little rough, right? So, that, I mean, even with things to like, there were still major structural, functional like areas of needed improvement, right? But you know. If Lance Guidry is able to do what he's done in a lot of different places, I think that the potential is there for Miami's defense to really take a big step forward, even this current year, uh, with a lot of new faces and a lot of young faces. But it was pretty bad last year, guys. So we can take a step forward, but it is incumbent upon him to show the same kind of job performance and his defenses play to the level here that we've seen before. If it doesn't, then obviously it's like you want the results, but this process, I believe, like the other ones, to hire him has been a substantive and positive process. But you need to see the results at some point. And that's what he signed up for. So we'll see if he's able to make it happen. Trying to uh, follow up and promote the show, and Twitter's just not letting me, so maybe it's not fixed. Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, if you go to all the metrics that Cam ran through, 
and you see all the teams that are surrounding Marshall in those rankings, both above and just beneath, you will be mighty impressed. Now, of course, they were playing a different level of schedule than the Alabamas and Michigans and Georgias that were surrounding them, Illinois and Iowa's in those defensive rankings, but still they also had that level of player defending those offenses on the schedule. So right. it's, it's like competition. And uh, again, went to Notre Dame and uh, laid down the hammer. Right. And I mean, that's the thing, like, it's not, it's not like, you know, you're playing an NCAA, you know, college football, or EA sports, whatever video game dynasty where you've turned, you know, Marshall or, you know, South Central Tech that you start as a one star school. And now there's five stars all over the roster. So they're not playing above, you know, like you're not stacked and then playing down in your conference USA. Like you're playing with like talented people and develop, developing them up and they're performing at a very high level, regardless of, you know, maybe they're not going to all go to the NFL, but they're doing a damn good job and they're, you know, at this level. But then also you played up and went on the road to South Bend and beat down Notre Dame, who's a team that's way more talented. So, yeah, there's a lot to like. Um, and, you know, Justin Tatavia already wrote a uh, piece for us at State of the U looking at uh, Guidry's scheme and how uh, players who are on this roster can fit to that and, you know, how those things can translate. And, I mean, he has to be like a kid in a candy shop because, again, you're getting all that done with, you know, the also-rans. You know what I mean? Like they're like Marshall's always been a team of cast offs, you know, like the guys who are, you know, you know, especially along the lines, maybe they're just a, an inch, you know, too short and 20 pounds lighter. Um, you know, maybe they're four steps slower. You know, if you have this big gigantic lineman, which they've had sometimes, you know, Randy Moss got kicked out of Notre Dame and Florida state. You know what I mean? Like they, they're an open box special school, you know, um, Tyree Brady, uh, Miami, uh, player of years past, uh, who went to Miami and then washed out here. He ends up there and he was very talented, but there were issues, you know? So like, finally they, they went and make, made it work, but like Marshall has not ever been or going to be a place that's going to, you know, recruit really, really well. Like if you're there, you're a mid-tier kind of a, of athlete, or you know, in the case of a now, clearly Randy Moss is one of the more talent, most talented players who's ever lived. But like I said, he got kicked out of two different premium locations, you know, premium premium schools, and then all right, well, and they were one double A then. That's FCS now. Like back when he started there, before they trans, you know what I mean? Uh, so you're gonna have some things like that. So maybe you got a couple guys with real serious you know athletic credentials more often not that you don't so spinning that all you know that that short detour long back to lance gidry instead of making it work with you know eh, you know okay a couple tweeters here and a couple guys who washed out somewhere else now you're coming to miami with the talent that's on this roster yo he has to be and you i mean look and yes, Tulane was damn good. 12 and 2 this past year. I watched a lot of their games because they were on a lot. You know, their uh, quarterback, Michael Pratt, went to Deerfield Beach Senior High School, which is where I had my first job. Uh, you know, all these kind of things. Tajay Spears, the running back, was nasty with it. Like, oh, yeah. And I'm sure he was excited for that. But like, yo, I get to, and uh, look, living in New Orleans, I've only been to New Orleans one time. I need to go back. But if you've never been to New Orleans, hey, now, <laughs> fun place. But now I get to leave from there and go to Miami which is its own kind of fun place. But in terms of who I'm working with, I'm working with players who are like, I mean, you can, many of them should be NFL guys. Many of them, not just like the one-off, like you might get a Marshall or one-off here and there in Tulane. You got more talent you can shake a stick at. You got a first team All-American at safety. You got another one who's, a, I mean, he was a high school All-American. He was, you know, uh, he's, one of the more physical players in the world of safety, James Williams. You got one of the five best defensive tackles in the country in Leonard Taylor, not to mention Akeem Mesidor, who's second team all ACC. Like, look, you got dudes now. So now I, you know, I can continue to scheme it up in this way, but now I got better athletes to implement my scheme and, and to perform those duties. Oh, man, man, let's get you got to be. <laughs> I was gonna, man. I was gonna use a phrase that my dad used to say. Um, but uh, he he will be a very happy 
individual. We'll call it that. Your phrase is welcome here. <laughs> uh, it's hey, whatever. Uh, you know, we have an interesting sense of humor in the Underwood family, but my father uh, describing someone who was very, very, very uh, pleased. Uh, he used to say, you're happy as a runaway slave. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it's exactly all the way there with it, but like, yeah, yeah hey, look, Lance yeah. Gidry has to be very, very pleased with this move to Miami. I can imagine, say, can I, I, I can't imagine a few moving. situations that would be more liberating well, <laughs> than well, that. Yeah, exactly. But, yes. You know, yeah. You went through the whole Randy Moss thing, and of course, then I thought, oh yeah, uh, I don't know that Marshall, not that this was quite the find of Randy Moss anywhere in the same stratosphere, but to have an NFL quarterback playing with him at Marshall at the same time, you know, an NFL starting quarterback, Chad Pennington, I don't think that they've they've been able to match anything close to that since. They, well, I mean, Rocky and Cato from Miami, well, he was at Miami Springs before he went to Miami Central. He yeah. went up there and then rewrote yeah. the record books as a quarterback. Uh, you know, Tyree Brady was there. There was a, a wide receiver, I think, that came up uh, with uh, Cato from South Florida. Uh, you know, but again, those are always the the tweeners or the academic cases. You know, that was famously a school for for a long, long time. You know, because their acceptance rate at, at Marshall is like 75, 80, 90 percent. It's, it's this very accommodating institution. Um, but it was known for a long time. If you're a top athlete, top football player and you're not able to you know get into any of the schools that you want to get to in miami florida state georgia lsu whatever well yeah. but you know if, if that's a struggle for you because you know you were focused on the field and focused in the hallways but not necessarily in your classroom until the bitter end um marshall can be the place for you so yeah byron leftwich of course leftwich went there great. as well of course yeah you yeah. know and uh, it is a really um, good movie made out of a just severe tragedy. Absolutely. All right. Falconer X, appreciate you. Thank you for the super sticker and the following super chat that says, we learned Mario keeps his plan to himself. We didn't learn that last year. <laughs> I mean, like this has been... You know, his MO, this is par for the course. You know, this is the way that things go. Like, yeah, well, you know, we can, you know, rumor about who we might want to see and the kind of schemes and the kind of, you know, whatever, whatever. And, you know, even last year, he's like, yeah, I'm going to get the higher, right. You know, remember we had that like 14 player recruiting class because we didn't really have assistance, you know, to recruit guys and things like that. He's like, okay, I'm going to hire the guys when I hire them. I'm going to trust my version of this process which we have heard from many people is an exhaustive interview process. Um, and I'm going to build the staff in the time that I have, excuse me, and did, you know, but yeah, he's uh, definitely not one to broadcast what he's thinking. And I mean, look, even after games and things, or even in interview settings, uh, Mark Cristobal is quick to just, not answer a question even if like a directly asked question we're there of which there were several you know hey you know what about this what about that look you know we have a plan and that's what it's going to be so boom and which is you know tacitly go after yourself and i'm not going to tell you what the plan is but i have a plan and i don't need to tell you anything else and you know a follow-up on that is just like okay cool i'm not going to answer your question anymore thanks very much next you know like Boom. So, like, yeah, he definitely keeps his plans to himself. But, you know, I think that this move with Lance Gidry was a good one. And I'm very interested to see where things go with offensive coordinator, quarterbacks coach, and wide receivers coach, which, again, are probably going to be two individuals for those three roles. But we'll see. Falcon Rex coming back. Thank you for that. Sir, does Gidry help Miami recruiting in the deep south i've uh you know heard that he was a very good talent evaluator i saw um again bruce feldman was talking about that in the string of tweets uh that uh, lance Gidry is a, a highly respected recruiter um and i think that that is found well i don't think i know and has been demonstrated over the course of his career that that's foundational for a mario cristobal organization including and especially for all of his assistants so uh, i think he will help miami in terms of recruiting um 
it needs to be seen. You know, he needs to do the job here at Miami. Uh, but from all accounts, yeah. He, I mean, and look, if you're if the defense that you run at Marshall is performing to the level that it is, that means the players you brought in and the development path that they've had has been exemplary. So you've identified those guys and been unable to unlock that potential and turn it into performance as well. So, uh, yeah, I think that he knows what he's talking about. I think it's been demonstrated. And um, I do not believe that he would be on this staff if recruiting was a, a, a net negative from him. You know what I mean? Falcon Rex is on a roll. We appreciate you, sir. Can Miami get an equal or better offensive coordinator than Gidry? Can, yes, will. That remains to be seen. Um, and again, for anybody who's only focused on whichever name or whatever names, expand your brain. And like I said last week, pretty much anybody who's – and I would – I mean, pretty much anybody is – is available. You know what I mean? Like you can go get guys up off of their good jobs. Now, do I think that Garrett Riley is going to leave Clemson? No. Is it entirely impossible? Also no. You know what I mean? Like I I don't think it's impossible, but I think it's improbable that that one individual, but like that's an individual kind of a thing, you know? But like it can Miami look for all the failings that happened last year? Josh Gaddis was the Broyles Award winner, and I know that people retroactively want to talk down about his offense at Michigan because you know Harbaugh wants to run things the way he wants to run things, and it wasn't a hundred percent of Josh Gaddis' mind, you know, uh, intellectual property turned into offense. He still did that job to that level, you know what I mean? Like. It just didn't work out here. Same thing, Dan Enos. Dan Enos is highly regarded. Look, and he's been to Maryland, and he's going around all these other places now where, like, okay, I tried to run things in this pro-style whatever way at Miami and then didn't necessarily work, got fired, going somewhere else. They're not running pro-style. Like, have you seen Talia Tungvaloa? Like, they're super spread, four, five wide. Like, they got a couple wide receivers probably going to go to NFL. You know what I mean? Like, what you saw there was not what he was running here, right? But he came in with all that acclaim. It just didn't work. So is it possible that we can, again, bring in somebody of that kind of well-regarded caliber? Absolutely, 100%. Um, I just don't know who's going to be. But, yeah, I think that we absolutely can and should bring in somebody else of quality. So, Kim, you just ran down a number of coordinators who had strong resumes, who came to Miami and underperformed. Mm -hmm. You also stated off the top, as we spoke about Gidry, that, of course, you want to see this uh, play out on the field, of course. Uh, but he has good credentials coming in. We shall see how this works out. Um, do you think that Miami has had an inordinate amount of coaching hires assistant and coordinator level coaching hires that have underperformed and how do you explain that when it's if if the answer is yes that it has yeah. spanned several head coaches well the answer is unquestionably yes and it's being cheap you know you're trying to you know, make those old dress shoes shine like they're brand new kind of a thing. And if you look at it, and it's interesting because I tweeted about this, but like, if you really think about it, the only assistant, and if there's anybody else, let me know, right? But the only assistant who has either maintained or, well, if I say maintained, then there's two, <laughs> but I'd say maintained their stature or improved their career prospects post Miami in the last 15 years, Thomas Brown, who's like in line to be an NFL head coach, is an associate head coach of the Rams, you know, won a Super Bowl there and everything. Like he's, and he's an impressive dude. I got to meet him a couple few times when he coached at Miami. He's an impressive 
guy. I root for that dude. That's why, you know, ever since I met him, I'm like, I'm just going to keep my eye on his career because he's going places. And then he, uh, you know, unfortunately, like, you know, Mark Rick left and da, 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 but he's cool. Like went to the league. Boom. He's going to be an NFL head coach and probably, eh, I mean, he's black, so I'm not sure sooner than later, but I think that he's on that trajectory, obviously having held that senior, senior, senior role, you know, for multiple years already. Past that, who's the assistant who's been hired away? Oh, before Kevin Steele. Todd Hartley at Georgia's tight ends going back where he once coached. I mean, yes and no. I mean, Manny Diaz seems to be, you know, kind of restoring some of the luster on his career. But again, he was head coach. And then we decided to go in a different direction to get a better coach and then rebuild this program. But I mean, who else is there? Not many. If any, right? Um, I mean, Travaris Robinson, Travis Williams, maybe. I mean, Travis Williams was a guy who was here for, you know, a week and a half. T-Rob was here for a year, but, I mean, he's he's T-Rob. So, I mean, he's kind of lateral, you know. He's back at Alabama. He's doing the thing. But, like, whereas most <clears throat> people were looking at him in this super, super, super high regard – I think now, like, and maybe this is a prospect or a, a, a fallout of Nick Saban assistants never doing media ever. It's kind of, I mean, he's doing a great job as coach because, like, that's what he does, but he's just a guy. Like, he doesn't even have, like, that gravitas that he once did. So, okay, fine. Even if I add those dudes, that's like six dudes in 15 years across all these assistants, you know, out of what, 80, 90 guys we've hired. You know, it's just been. You, I mean, like you get some bad breaks, obviously, and then you get some just bad coaching and just the the staunch belief that what I want to do is going to work, regardless of what we're seeing from all these coaches, is a thing that like Miami's had to overcome. And yeah, uh, the assistants have some have you know done well and others have not. Um, but, I mean, yeah, like that was, what, seven guys? You know, uh, Thomas Brown, Manny Diaz, who, again, I know was head coach of the day, Todd Hartley, Travaris Robinson, T-Rob, but T-Rob's T-Rob, Travis Williams. I mean, Kevin Beard, he left to go to uh, Toledo. He's doing a great job there, but, like, that's clearly a step down, even though he's doing a great job. I mean, Ron Dugans, but Ron Dugans was – Ron Dugans, you know, he's been coaching forever. He's been, you know, six different schools. So fine. And he goes back to his alma mater. Great. Cool. Fine. Wonderful. But like, you know, I, it, and the wide receivers when he was here, like, yeah, they blocked well, but like, man, they weren't the greatest. So yeah, I mean, it's just been, it's been a lot. And it's, it's just not when you, when you're trying to find a bargain and make a bargain into something special every single time, a lot of times you're going to come up short. It's going to look like the bargain that you paid for. And I think that that's really been a thing with Miami and their assistance over the course of, you know, these low, what, 15, 18 years. I'm hesitating making this statement, but I, 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 I'm going to go back to something that you said concerning, I forget who it was now, uh, one of those particular assistants uh, and, oh, it was, um, Brown and his chances at an NFL head coaching job being yeah. compromised by his race. Yeah. Well, if that if that still exists, then we're in a horrible situation. Well, I mean, like, like I, I mean, he can get a job for a year and then get run off. I mean, what the Houston's are on what three coaches in three years? They've all been black. I mean, Steve Wilkes didn't get hired in Carolina, you know, and everything. I mean, like, to the Mike Tomlins of the world are the exception, not the rule, you know. And yeah, he might get up. I mean, Eric B still there in Kansas city. You know what I mean? Like that, that's what I'm talking about. You know, like getting, getting a job and a job that you want and the backing of the organization to like stay there. That's, those are few and far between, you know, go look at, go look at Carolina. Steve Wilkes wanted to be there. The players wanted him to be there, you know, see what was done after they got rid of Matt rule and all those kind of things. Like, cool. Yeah, no Houston, I mean, pretty much any 
and like I'm I've heard this from other people. Like I know on his show, Bomani Jones has said this many a time. But like if you ever look at a reclamation project, that team, that time, that's when they're gonna hire somebody black. And you're gonna be there long enough to whatever, be a good story for a year and then gone. And again, if you look at Houston, it's been multiple times. Now they hired D'Amico Ryans, who was an all pro player for them, to come back and be their coach now. So I think that he's going to get maybe a little bit more run way than the previous guys, but like yeah, no, there there's still issues uh, regarding, uh, and I mean, not just even, uh, you know, black people, but people of, of color. I mean, like Robert Sala is, you know, one of one, you know, like Ron Rivera was, you know, he's one of one, I believe, Latin head coaches, uh, Latino head coaches. Like, it's not just black people, but like, yeah, it's a thing. And, and again, even if you have somebody who is, I think, more more accomplished, and further along the path towards being a head coach as an Eric Bieniemy, but then you have an associate head coach who's been there for multiple years, like a, a a Thomas Brown, right? So even if Thomas Brown is in that line, he has to be queuing up behind Eric Bieniemy. But Eric Bieniemy is not even getting interviews to potentially move somewhere else. So yeah, it's just a unfortunate, you know, state of the construct of the National Football League. Hmm. All right, uh, Kyloran Miami Kane. Thank you so much for the contribution. We appreciate you being here as always. Gaddis out. We should hire Will Stein, offensive coordinator at Oregon. So okay. he just got that job. I don't know where he came from. Of course, he's taking over for Kenny Dillingham, now the head coach at Arizona State. Will Stein. Um, let's see. UTSA? Yeah. Okay. Previously served as co-offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Meep, meep. Shout out to uh, Larry Coker, who started that program uh, <laughs> down right. there uh, with the Roadrunners. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, you could do that. You know, uh, that is an option. I would put him just because of the short time that he's been there since he's been hired uh, in a similar kind of state, like um, the Riley brother at Clemson. Like that's just, now it's not impossible. Clearly we just saw that we hired somebody up off their good job in less than a month, you know, there at Tulane with Gidry. Um, I just think that you're going to have to have, you're going to want somebody who's like fully into do to rebuilding this in Miami because like it, love it, hate it, or whatever you want to say for next year, the better job is offensive coordinator at the university of Oregon for next year. I'm not going to say overall or your path is a, but like I'm stepping into a pretty ready made team. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like I got a quarterback who, I mean, he's been around forever, but he finally took a massive step forward. We got a, you know, great offensive line thanks to our previous coaching staff. You know, we have, you know, dynamic running backs thanks to previous coaching staff. We got good receivers. I mean, current and previous staff. Like, I mean, Mario left them well stocked in the cupboard, bro. You know what I mean? Like, there was no dearth of talent or infrastructure or development or anything. But you're going to step into that versus, you know, Stepping into this, not even gut renovation, this teardown, and you're going to have to, you know, be in there, you know, putting up walls and, you know, wiring the house and everything. Yeah, for next year, I don't think it's crazy at all to say that OC at Oregon is a more attractive job to someone than doing whatever needs to be done here in Miami. But if you're in for it, it could be, you know, a high risk, high reward kind of a thing where, you know, if you're the one who turns it around, it work out well for you, which is why Josh Gaddis took this job because, you know, he's been stumping to be a head coach for multiple years. So he was like, cool, Alabama, Michigan, Miami, boom, boom, boom. I hit all three of those. They're going to give me the big chair. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we kicked him out the front door. Oregon, number six in total offense last season. And as Cam mentions, their trigger man is back, Bo Nix. He accounted for 44 touchdowns. Yeah, that'll work. Jason Candle will not 
be the offensive coordinator, according to Falcon or X. I agree. Because again, going back to my firm supposition, if you hear the name, it ain't going to be the name. And not just like, hey, who would you hire? Da, 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 da. But like, if you think, oh, well, it's been rumored that. And like, da, 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 da. sources tell. Da, 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 da. It's not going to be that person. And, and that's been borne out to be true with every single hire so far that Mario Cristobal's made. Every single one. Every single one. So the next time that you hear who he wants before he hires him will be the first time. So we've heard so much about Jason Candle. It ain't going to be Jason Candle. And hey, you know, maybe they finally proved me wrong, but I don't know. I am with you, Falcon Rex. 180, meaning 180 watching. We're up to 214 now to 44, meaning likes is piss poor. Hit both the like button. It does not cost nothing. Or that was a double negative, Falcon Rex. I should have cleaned <laughs> it up for you. Falcon Rex coming back. We appreciate you, sir. I hope you know that. Uh, Jason Taylor and TBD need promotions. He means DVD, isn't it? Oh, I was going to say, well, uh, TBD, what kind yeah, no, of does he get? Yeah, no, uh, okay. Uh, he got yeah. His even though they're not related, that is their last name. Both. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, that really just occurred to me. Anyway, um. Okay, so Jason Taylor, Hall of Fame defensive end. Excuse me, Jason Taylor, who's a defensive analyst, and Demarcus Van Dyke, who uh, Miami alum, former five star recruit, played in the NFL. He came back. He's been in the recruiting department. He traded with Mark Rump for recruiting versus on field coaching a couple years ago. Then we had Jamila die to do all of the uh, secondary coaching instead of splitting that between safeties and corners, you know, and then put DVD back into uh, a recruiting role, which he excels at. Um, I could see them needing, wanting promotions unless or until the NCAA expands coaching staffs, of, you know, further because it used to be a head coach and nine assistants. A couple of few years ago, it went to head coach and 10 assistants. Unless you get more than that, they're going to have to look elsewhere. And look, Demarcus Van Dyke interviewed for the cornerback coaching job at North Carolina. It was reported he did not get that job, but he clearly wants and desires that kind of growth to his career. Jason Taylor, I do, I do not foresee him staying as a defensive analyst for the entirety of the rest of his coaching career. It's great that he's working with our defensive ends while he's here. You know what I mean? But I don't think that that's sustainable, you know, long term or even in the medium term. So unless you're going to, you know, get rid of some people, I don't, I mean, I don't see a path towards them being promoted here. And this is kind of that all-star snub debate. And I've always held this like, oh, this guy, you know, he got, he, he should have been in there and da, 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 da. who are you taking off? Same exact thing. If you're thinking, okay, these guys, need, these guys need promotions. Who are you getting rid of to give them a zish? Because that will be what is required to create the space to make that happen. I mean, yeah, I think that they both could get and for a variety of reasons deserve. Well, life ain't about deserve, but uh, have demonstrated the uh, acumen to fill the role of being promoted on the staff. But unless Mara was going in a different way and somebody either leaves for a new job, which again has been few times and far between in the last 18 years, 20 years in Miami for assistant coaches, then uh, they're going to have to kind of stay where they are and then maybe look next year, uh, either at Miami or elsewhere again for, you know, DVD. Eddie showing up tonight. Good to see you, Eddie. Thank you so much for your contribution, sir. Cam and Mark. If Mario hires these new coordinators and coaches and this team goes five and seven again or goes six and six, which is not a significant improvement, what will be the conversations moving forward? I think it's about how you get there, honestly, because, yes, you want the result and the result in terms of wins and losses to be different. But if the process is improved, that can be part of the conversation as well. And look. This is not a one or two year rebuild. So even at six and six, that is not fully indicative of where Mario Cristobal wants to take this program. However, 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 at some point you got to start winning games. 
and there's going to be if Miami finishes again five and seven, six and six, somewhere in there. Seven, I mean, borderline seven and five, but that's a securely winning record. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, there's going to be more chatter. I mean, and that's just facts of the matter. You know, is Mario the guy for this? Is this rebuild going the way that it, you know, needs to? Uh, you know, did he bring in, you know, are they doing the right thing schematically on offense? Are they do, taking to advantage, advantage of the talent there? Are they doing, you know, proper things on defense are is the game being managed better are the penalties down you're like there, there's going to be all kinds of chatter um and everything but i believe that mark cristobal is still going to you know continue the path forward in the same kind of a way because i think that's just who he is and he's very he's a true believer of what he's selling. You know what I mean? So he's not just going to switch it off, but yeah, I mean, if, if there is a similar kind of record result this year, then you're going to hear similar kind of things. And I mean, maybe the, the volume outside gets turned up, but I, I mean, if you're looking for me to say like, yeah, like Mario is going to be on the hot seat. No, no, no. It's just after two years, it's not going to happen. It's just not, you know, it's, you're looking at this as a, you know, three plus, four plus year restructuring of the organization entirely, you know? So like, will it suck as a fan? Will there be chatter from, you know, fans, you know, of Miami from, you know, rivals, you know, other teams and everything. So, you know, Florida state, they're going to be in year four. They're, you know, they have a, dynamic quarterback who looks to pretty much elevate everybody around him on that program uh, and everything. And they could have a solid season. So would it be injurious to like the morale to see them have a strong season in Miami? Potentially not. Yeah. But again, this is the journey of a thousand miles, not the sprint of a single step. So even with things going the way that you've hypothesized, there will be conversations, but we're not getting anywhere near the point of like anything being terminal for Mario here. Absolutely. From that standpoint, in regards to talking about firing, but in terms of conversations, and I know when he says conversations, talking about exactly what you addressed, but talking about what we do here and in other places, other platforms and talking about evaluations, we are still looking at it is, you know, this is a roster that was built with recruiting classes that ranked 11, 11, 13, and seven for this particular class, which will have only so much impact on the coming season because of course it's a freshman class and has done rather well in the transfer portal. Mm -hmm. So the team talent composite for the 22 season, number 12 in the nation should be similar, if yeah. not better with a number seven recruiting class and a mm -hmm. good transfer portal showing for 23, which is not out yet. I, you got to understand, I, I don't get why this record can't elevate sooner and more decidedly. But like you, before I let you comment on that and respond on that, I like you, I just don't stand on the record. Okay, the record six and six, that is that is bottom line, how everyone's judged. What was your record? Okay, you got ranked 12th in the country. You were nine and three. Okay, fine. Da, 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 da. Where did you go in the playoff or a bowl game? Yes, that's the bottom line, the results. But mm. in terms of evaluating a coach, especially taking over a program in which um, there is a rebuild involved, you see seven and five teams out there all the time that are like seven and five. They beat everyone that they should beat, and they beat them by seven to 10 points. They didn't look ultra impressive, and they lost five games, and they clearly showed that they are light years away from ca catching the elite in their conference mm -hmm. versus seven and five. 
okay, we got something going here, man. We pushed Clemson to the hilt and we took Florida State to the you know, final minute. Well, that's something to get excited about. That's a different seven and five evaluation. But looking at these recruiting classes, both brought in by Mario and before him, so give some credit to Manny Diaz. Mm-hmm. They they have a nine and three roster. Easily. Absolutely. Yes. 100%. And I mean, do we want it to be better sooner than later? Yes. Um, there's still some gaps to be able to making that happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, it, there are moral victory concerns. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, like you had a, a bad turnover or like a, a bad bounce, you know, in a game or, you know, you're closing the gap to the teams that you lost to previously, you know, the Carolina, North Carolina, uh, sorry, Carolina, Clemson, Florida States, who, you know, won by four or five, six touchdowns, you know, maybe, well, except for Carolina, that was another close loss, but, you know, you know, things like that. Uh, and then just the random once in a literal lifetime, middle Tennessee state shenanigans stop happening. You know, like there can be growth, internal growth that does not necessarily result in a much more uh a much stronger win loss record that is possible oh absolutely but, yeah i mean we want to see wins and i mean the town is there but there's also gaps in this roster where like they got to play another team on a you know well two thursdays and a friday and a bunch of saturdays uh, throughout the next season but you know those gaps have functional effect or the the lack of something on the roster like not having a number one wide receiver that has a negative impact on the game you know even again what could what would this team be with charleston rambo not like 25 year old charleston rambo but like 22 year old you know you know 2021 season charleston rambo on the roster how much better would this team be? Two games? Three? I mean, like, that's literally the kind of gap that would the glaring hole that we have on this kind of a roster, you know? So it there, there's a lot that goes into it. I'm going to produce a video at some point in the next few weeks because this kind of fascinates me. Dumb things like this, uh, just kind of oddities, fascinate me. But um, if we ask the average college football fan in a typical season, from season to season, out of the 65 Power 5 teams, how many would elevate at least three games in the win column or decline at least three games meaning you rate and four last year you go to 11 and one or you go to five and seven that that to me i just i made that delineation is thinking that's the first number that seemed substantial to me three games not two but three so i just chose that number plus it hit me a few years ago that the athlons and the street and smiths of the world for as good as they are at what they do they're extremely overly conservative in making predictions yes they keep it tight to the vest and if you were eight and four last year they might nudge you to nine and three or if you lost a really good quarterback it, and everybody's like and that's not the reality out there so i started to right. track this year to year who elevates or declines by at least three games and it's usually in the power five i thought it was going to be like eight because i think most of our perception of college football is eh, it stays the same every year well, it stays the same at the elite level, pretty much. Mm -hmm. But everybody else is scrambling around. And, and that the other number, Cam, no, it's usually between 17 and 22. I've, I've charted this for about five years. Last year, 27 teams in the Power Five. Yeah. Almost half of them either had that kind of elevation or declined, a la Oklahoma, 10 and 2 to 6 and 6. Michigan mm -hmm. State, 10 and 2 to 5 and 7, et cetera, et cetera. Duke you know, three and nine to eight and four regular season. Right. And like, we did talk about this uh, very thing last year, which is very interesting 
uh, thought experiment. Well, not thought experiment, but, you know, kind of uh, analysis. But the thing about it is, and I've been thinking about my view of this conversation as well. On a large level, people don't really know what's going on outside of like their team and maybe rival team and like the super top. So if they see, you know, like, and the records are going to be as in a team finishes with the record of seven and five or five and seven. So the records are going to look like they always look because obviously you have to have as many losses as you have wins in a season. So like, Oh, okay. There's, a team that slots in there or whatever. That it is. So it's like, oh yeah, they're, they're usually there. No, they're not usually there, but they have a record that finishes it with a familiar number to the viewer. So then they just ascribe that to that team in that instance. You know what I mean? It's like, oh yeah, well they're, they're always around that. Or they, yeah, they're usually, or maybe they had a bad year or like, da, 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 but like they kind of write it off because they're not really, looking at the full landscape they're looking you know at their team the top top teams you know you're going to get those eight o'clock you know espn games uh you know the 330 cbs games and then yeah so i think that's where people's perception is not as strong because if it's not their team like oh okay well illinois finishing six and six that's reasonable sure yeah they're, they're about that you know, they were actually really good. They were like eight and four, nine and three. Oh, well, oh, they were? Hmm, interesting. Okay, cool. You know, it would be that kind of journey towards seeing that. Um, but yeah. I just find that interesting. And I see, you know, for me, right out of the gate, Colorado's an obvious candidate. One in 11. Deion Sanders comes in, he's grabbing players left and right, both in recruiting from high school and transfer portal for them to elevate to four and eight won't surprise anyone. So they're an obvious candidate produce an obvious candidate going the other way, eight and four last year, but man lost anybody who made a play on offense coach and quarterback. So Miami looks to me as a candidate to go from five and seven to eight and four. Is that what makes Miami a candidate? their talent oh yeah exactly sorry like, <laughs> same friend of every wednesday no, that, that's all right uh yeah, i was just for just one second but uh but yes miami's talent obviously does and falcon rex hey man you know thank you i appreciate it and i'm trying to uh if, i mean if you're listening to this later if anybody just podcast he says my calming voice stops him from jumping off the coaching carousel cliff um, CCC, which is a great alliteration. So I uh, appreciate that. But, you know, as I uh, am still recovering from my vocal cord issues, I'm trying to produce and support my voice in a different way um, with the resonance and just with the, the whole physicality of everything that I'm doing. So, yeah, that I think is coming through as the soothing dulcet tones of, you know, the quiet storm on V98.7 or whatever. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah. All right. Really good stuff. I got one uh, fist pound of support there from Nick. Mark is correct. Can't keep giving excuses for Mario when he has. Well, let's understand that the five and seven or six and six forecasted season has not occurred yet. So it's only been one bad season. You know, well, let's not take that as a given, but better coaching and better recruiting where previous coaches played with what was given. I mean, better recruiting, like, I think it'll be better consistently, but I mean, Miami's had top five, number one overall classes, you know, like it's, it's hard to get better than number one, which I know Miami had in 2008. Now I know that that was 15 years ago, but I'm just saying, you know, like, I think that it'll be consistently top 10, which is the issue where we've seen, you know, a five here and a six there. And then, you know, low teens into twenties and the, you know what I mean? Like things like that. But I think it will continue to be, at a very high level and like hot take bold, you know, bold view, whatever you want to call it. Like if Miami even shows half a ounce of real live, true and honest improvement on the field this year, it's a top three recruiting class in 2024, like top three. And if you're, 
you know, Cormani McLean of the world, you know, your Nick Harbor of the world was in this class. You're talking top five, probably top four as opposed to number seven. So the margins are really thin as in one decision can shake things one way or another. But like Charles Johnson, hey, if if Miami steps up to eight and four, that's your, you know, marks plus three movement in terms of wins. This is absolutely like a top three recruiting class in the country. And I said it probably a couple months ago, you know, as a wrap up here, but you know, the goal here is to keep the cream of the crop on the roster and turn over everybody else. And Miami's bringing in almost 40 guys this year and will be doing similar numbers next year. So when we are going into the 2024 season, there'll be nearly an entirely new team as opposed to what we saw in 2022 with, you know, a handful of exceptions of elite players that are still going to be on this roster. And that's what Miami needs. And clearly what Mario, who gives no F about that noise, (laughs) what, uh, what Mario is trying to do in terms of uh, reshaping the roster, rebuilding this organization and moving Miami forward. We appreciate everybody who's joined us tonight. So we we appreciate every type of contribution. So everybody that uh, joins here in the chat should at least hit the like button. Thank you for that. And uh, let people know that we are here every Wednesday night with Cam. He is going to take a week off at some point. But, uh, you know, just we are here basically every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock Eastern time for Miami Football Talk. We got about 250 on the line. Most of you joined us later, so you know what to do. You can catch all of Cam's analysis and my one uh, rant on how Miami's talent should convert better. Sure. With, with with more wins, but uh, you can catch all of that uh, if you wait for the video to post, which should be immediately after we get done here and watch what you missed. I missed one point of conversation. I know that you're wrapping up, and I'm going to keep this one very short. We can dive into it more next week. Anton Jackson from Miami, oh, sorry, uh, Fort Lauderdale Dillard High School has reportedly asked out of his NLI with Miami. Um, Four-star, he was supposed to be 24 kid. He reclassified up. He's still in high school currently. Um and is uh he's that kid you know who's the 16 year old so he's young for his grade and then he reclassified up a year so he's like two years younger um than his grade i mean like the washington twins robbie and bobby they just had their 19th birthday the other day and they're in the same recruiting class they're currently enrolled they were early enrollees but then anton jackson in that same class um is 16 years old. Uh, so he apparently is, has asked out of his NLI. We'll see how things go. If it were me, I would just let him go. Um, I get where if Miami takes a different stance, uh, you know, Gabby Rudy, he was saying that they checked with him and are like, Hey, like, you know, this is like, yes, your passion. And yes, you know, we want you and everything, but like, this is business. So like, if you are not certain, at least to the level that you could be, then, we should take a pause. He's like, no, I'm going to sign him da, 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 and did. Um, and if they then take that and just say, well, you know, I lost Scotty Pippen who signed that ridiculously undervalued contract with the bulls. So you made your choice and we gave you the opportunity, but like you said, this is what you wanted because you grew up poor in central Arkansas. And so you wanted the stability of a long-term contract, but then you saw revenues bursting and, you know, other players on the team who don't even play, but they're making double what you're making. Look, we're not going to go and relitigate your contract because we gave you the opportunity and that's what you chose. And so if Miami were to do the same thing and to say, you know, uh, Mr. Jackson, look, unfortunately, we're not going to release you from your national letter of intent. You are free to transfer somewhere, but that would then burn your free use transfer as a 16 year old going into uh, college as a true freshman elsewhere. If they choose to do that, I would not necessarily agree with it, but I would understand it. If that's the foundation for that, but obviously, you know, we'll see. But anyway, uh, this team is going to be all right. This team is going to be okay. And uh, with or without Anton Jackson, uh, there will be the sunrise tomorrow. So uh, I'll just say that to wrap up here. And the Chiron tells you all the things you need to know. My name is Cam Underwood, Magic Editor of State of the U, where we are always talking about the Canes 24-7, 365. Had a huge, massive blowout win against Duke on Big Monday. Um, 
You know, we are a half game out of first place in the ACC men's basketball, women's basketballs, uh, you know, had a couple setbacks, but still uh, playing hard. But we, uh, you know, have uh, this week in basketball um, and everything. So Mike Schiffman is running our basketball coverage. He's doing great stuff. Justin Dottavio has shipped in with a few great things as well. We have uh, other uh, great commentary on the site as well. So stateoftheview.com is the internet address, Instagram Facebook and uh, I don't know what's going on with the other one, but uh, Twitter was at <laughs> the state of the U. My personal Twitter, if it works, I have no idea, is at Underwood Sports. And uh, yeah, I will take a week or two off uh, here, but I definitely wanted to be here, especially since we just hired a defensive coordinator. Uh, and it's always fun to be here with you guys at, uh, you know, Wednesday at seven and talk to Mark and everything. So thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you come on over and fan with us at state of the and we'll see you soon. Cam, if you have the time, I'll take you for 30 seconds after we get done here. Everyone, we appreciate you being here. It's every Wednesday, except for when somebody takes a vacation, but every Wednesday, basically. Oh, quick super chat. Leroy, Cam, is it true that Jalen Hurts was looking into transferring to Miami and the report said Saban did not want him to come here? Info on that. Nick Saban said it personally on video. Like, yeah. He like it was an interview. He was asked because clearly every Saban's always recruiting, and there's you know more than a couple uh, Alabama players in the Super Bowl. And he was asked about Jalen Hurts and you know everything, and you know obviously making the move of benching him in the national championship game against Georgia and going to Tua, and then they ended up winning. And, and yeah, I mean Nick Saban himself. Then you go look up the video. I don't know. Well, I would say on Twitter, but uh, um, but yeah, he. He himself was asked and then said, yeah, you know, um, he was, uh, Hertz was looking at Miami or, ah, damn, I don't remember the name of the other team. Um, but yeah, he was looking at Miami and somewhere else, um, as his destination. And Nick Saban was like, no, you should not do that. You should look at somewhere that is more ready-made for you to be successful. And, you know, somewhere like, uh, Oklahoma, you know, and Jalen Hurts was looking at the kind of hero ball um, progression, like we're talking about with, you know, offensive coordinators. Like, if I go there and all of a sudden now we're able to elevate, like, yo, I'm a made man. And, but the thing about that, as Nick Saban was saying, Lord Jesus, um, was that is a high risk, high reward situation. You are further from your goal. So why don't you go somewhere that's more ready made and just missing you as the piece, not you going there and then trying to elevate everything. Everything is elevated. You can elevate it even further, but the floor is so much higher and the ceiling is pretty unlimited. Um, but yeah, he, and I, I wish I remember, I don't remember the name of the other team, but yeah, Jalen Hurts was like, I want to go. I'm looking strongly at Miami and insert team here. And Nick Saban was like, nah, Oklahoma, that's where really where you want to go. So, I mean, I will take him pretty much at his word on that because he wasn't even asked about the recruitment to Alabama. So, um, yeah, that's what Nick Saban said, recorded and in public about the situation. So that's the view I have on that. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Again, please subscribe, hit that bell for the notifications to know when we go live, and we will see you all soon.